The Tarkine is indefinable. First, how to carve scents from sensory excess from visual gluttony. The Tarkine consists of a series of edges that one tilts dangerously close to, slip and perhaps plunge into a catastrophe of self, or the shattering disintegration might remake you. To visit is to experience juxtaposition, unremitting edges razor into the psyche and rip at the tenuous demarcations of integrity. The aftermath is a struggle for poetry or prose to make clear a purpose far broader than the mere description to preserve. Beauty is elementary, meaning is elusive. Indeed, this is the challenge that affronts all who seek to define this place. It was with this challenge in mind, Tarkine in Motion was born. Tarkine is vast, 477,000 hectares of mostly uninterrupted wilderness. Other than relatively recent incursions from forestry, mining and recreational vehicle activity, it contains treasures immeasurable. But what of its future? Will the ancient secrets of this land continue to be gnawed at by greed and ideology? Or can a new lamp be lit and held high for those who need to look up with certainty? I think that art and music are fantastic change agents. And if I can be part of changing people's appreciation and um, opinion of this area, instead of it just being some area to be used and abused and extracted, if I can come along and help interpret this artistically so that people can get a uh, a, a better understanding of what is here and the natural wonders and the natural beauty, then that's why I'm here, to represent um, the wild. It feels nice to be a part of something bigger. Um, I'm not just out on my own taking photos, I'm actually here for a reason, I'm actually here to do something. And um, I'm doing it as a part of a, of a big, bigger group of people, and that's nice. It's nice to be a, a part of something like that. It, and it goes to show too that you don't have to be the world's best filmmaker and you don't have to be uh, um, a photographer like me to, to be able to capture the beauty of the Tarkon. There are other ways that people can do it. And it's wonderful knowing that there's some magnificent artists out there creating all sorts of things. It's great that, that everyone can feel a part of the Tarkon. Primarily, I think, I think it's just such an exciting idea bringing together so many artists from so many different backgrounds, printmakers, jewellers, dancers, photographers, videographers, I mean it's a long list of talent and I think to have successfully brought that off so that there are nearly 70 people roaming around the Tarkine this weekend or this Easter is just extraordinary. What was equally as extraordinary was the huge logistical operation that took place in the weeks leading up to Easter. $20,000 was crowdfunded in a month over 200 kilograms of food was donated and distributed. Maps were scrutinised by artists and organisers, making plans for immersion. The logistics for this project was an interesting one, especially for me, not being really used to handling 60 plus people in a remote area, uh, catering to different dietary requirements. Um, it was, a, it was a team effort to get food donations in, to um, make up dehydrated food, to pack it all up. It was an absolute team effort and came all together just a couple of days before. It has been a challenge to um, you know, make sure people are uh, being able to go out and experience what they, they want to. Um, I think it wouldn't have been able to happen without the help of people like Elki, without so many fantastic volunteers coming together and without the generosity of uh, um, many companies that donated food. But why the Tarkine? What called so many creative minds and volunteers to such a place? Tarkine makes me feel alive. Vibrant, connected, grounded, present, and in a place that I'm meant to be. 
being in the Tarkine makes you feel very humble, but it makes you also feel um, yourself. It teaches you about your humanness, human nature. Whenever I look at nature, I see human nature, and that's what I'm interested in because it's all sort of projecting back to me. I feel very calm when in forest, forest areas like, like the Tarkine, where it's very often very peaceful and like I just feel at home. The rainforest for me is always a place that I kind of I feel very nurtured. There's something about the kind of sort of the darkness and the moistness and the green and the mossiness that kind of makes me want to just kind of crawl in there. And that is like contrasted really strongly with kind of the wild coast and the big sort of bones of the earth of the rocks. I love the rawness, the energy, I feel invigorated. If I go home and paint in the studio, I do a lot of sea paintings. Every now and then I have to drive back, even if it's just a city, and watch the waves. And then I feel, OK, I can feel what it is again. Most of the time, the Tarkine makes me feel quite euphoric. I mean, you're out here in a land that is ancient you're standing in a place that hasn't changed since the last ice age. You can stand on a headland and just imagine 300, 3,000, 30,000 years ago just watching one of the world's most ancient cultures as they go about their daily lives and that makes me feel quite euphoric. Well as a human being uh, it was quite humbling. The size of the area and the age of the area and just the visual impact that assaults the senses when you get there. I feel very privileged to be camping here with kelp forest behind us where we can see from the shell middens that Aboriginal women for thousands of years have been diving, collecting shellfish. Uh, it just feels an immense privilege to be able to sit here and appreciate this place. And so as a result of numerous times I'm sort of developing my own relationship with this place that's kind of getting more diverse and more deep as it continues. And I sort of look forward to going back there as often as possible. A little blue bird came to me Somewhere between forest and sea It sang a song to me I'm calling
The sense of emptiness in the Tarkine landscape is visceral and can leave one uneasy, seeing the living areas of the old people, desecrated and disrespected, fills one with shame. But now, with this group, there is a movement of curiosity and empathy, a hunger to understand and interpret this place, and perhaps that void is being filled. From the communal hub in Corinna, artists went west to the mouth of the Pyman River and hiked up the coast to Rupert Point and the Interview River. Others explored the Savage River forests, climbing Mount Donaldson or potted along the Norfolk Road to Balfour and everywhere in between. Is this what we call Tarkine? These inland seas of tawny green, the high steep ridge of heath and sedge, quartzite crested waves rolling down to soundless break on forest shores, the island trees still standing firm, the long wide reach of lowland plain rolling still, but gentler now. The button grass, a satin ripple in the breeze, breathing mists unto the dawn. The Rupert Point artists engaged themselves with a landscape seemingly forged in the fires of a thousand fantasies. Twisted and gnarled ogre-shaped stone persevere in a relentless struggle with an unrelenting ocean. Luxuriant gardens of grasses and succulent plants of the most unexpected forms and colours swathe shore and dune. Wombats and wallabies wander through the campsite, barely acknowledging these latest intruders. It's really hard to describe the effect this place and a lot of natural places have on me, which I think is partly why I work um, visually as an artist, because I like my images to speak for themselves. So we've got some really beautiful shapes in the rocks that look like dragon's teeth and um, a real wildness to this place that I really, really love and I'd like to be able to share that. So here I've been walking along the shore and using what I find to make sound as well as using the objects, the sound objects that I brought with me. So I brought with me a viola, a bamboo flute, a very tinny battery operated keyboard, it's about that long, um, a blues harp, a tiny little old karinka, and my own voice. This area, despite its remoteness, is no stranger to intruders and their mark is slashed into the most precious features. Despite a ban on recreational vehicle activities south of Sandy Cape, many still flout the law. This vision, taken at the Interview River over Easter, was handed on to the authorities. I joined the Tarkine in Motion event because I'm particularly interested in this place in the wake of some of the court cases that are currently occurring with groups like the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre trying to protect their landscape. It was also an opportunity to support some of the amazingly talented artists documenting the place. Well, at the moment, uh, the Tasmanian government is trying to reopen some four-wheel drive tracks. There's a, uh, they forced the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre to go to court in an effort to keep those tracks closed in order to protect their cultural heritage, middens and other valuable sites from being damaged. A key threat to these sites is four-wheel drive impacts. Uh, there's lots of evidence of four-wheel drive vehicles going straight over the top of midden sites uh, just here is some broken beer bottles which have picked up in one stroll across the edge of a midden. Some people care for the area but it only takes a few not respecting it to cause permanent damage. Yeah a lot of mixed feelings sometimes uh, I feel a bit fragile emotionally I feel uh, quite charged with the Aboriginal history that's here because there are middens so there's uh, some emotion about that. Um, 
there's a deep sense of wanting to look after it and in my very small way to be able to contribute to that to really celebrate it to um, endorse a sense of sacred place perhaps Despite that particular incident, the rest of the time on the South Tarkine coast was productive and peaceful. From my place on the beach where I have set up my musical instruments made from found objects and things I brought here, I look out at a sea that will not lie down. It toils and troubles, boils, doubles and saturates itself with roiling and spoiling any calm made possible by the idea of peace. The spray following the surf is as a thousand spurts from funnels furious. Yet it's magnificently rejuvenating. I'm charged and changed. Back at Corinna, Kelly Alexander, a choreographer from Melbourne, began working with filmmaker Sarah Abbott on a movement piece. Writer and photographer Lindsay Evans ferried Ilona Schneider and her extraordinary photographic sideshow to Balfour for a look at a different side of the Tarkine's past. The nature of my photography is human nature. Since I came here, I have been looking around, sort of I'm always interested in the relationship between landscape and human dwelling and how we relate to nature and industry and dwelling, how we settle and how we fit into the landscape. So I went to Balfour to visit, uh, go, uh, I think tin mining they did there, and uh, looked at the remnants of this uh, township in the middle of the rainforest, which was a very interesting experience. But mostly I was taken by something it's called Solastalgia, that meaning it has um, so has something to do with nostalgia and solace, and it's sort of being homesick in one's own country, in one's own home. When our environment change in which we live, that we suffer some sort of a nostalgia, which is our solastalgia, basically. Is this what we call Tarkine? These ruins? slowly rusting, slowly rotting back into the ground. These vanished towns left all unpeopled, save by shades and memories, ghosts. Ghosts of miners, ghosts of piners, ghosts of dreams gone and forgotten with their dreamers, lost and broken in a past as grey and misty as the leaden skies that weep down raindrop tears over wounds carved all uncaring in the earth. The rainbow smear of tainted waters leaching out from tailing heaps a glitter in the sun. Father and daughter team Grant and Jess Murray roamed far and wide throughout the Tarkine. Jess making a short film and recording the sounds of the forests while Grant worked on his own short film, as well as on a number of stunning still images produced in his unique style. Since I've arrived in the Tarkine, we've been concentrating on photography in forests so far. Uh, we've been looking at ferns and trees, waterfalls, beautiful things like that. I'm passionate about wild places. I love Tasmania, that's why I live here. And what better place to come to demonstrate the beauty of this island state. All the while, Elke, Alex and Irene kept things at the southern hub ticking over, making delicious food and ensuring everyone was in good health and able to access the areas they wished for their artistic explorations. So far so good, we haven't lost anyone yet. Um, it's been going really well, don't you laugh? Um, it's, I think I'm seeing friendships forming, I'm seeing um, this going on beyond when we all go home tomorrow. Um, so far so good and I think everybody's been really happy and made some comments about their creative space and yeah it's just been incredible. But it was the northern hub of Arthur River that saw the most action with meals for up to 30 cooked each night by the unflappable Laura Granger. 
Jenny Webber and Mark Downey coordinated artists and drivers for trips into threatened forests and a private coastal property. Um, so what I might do now is just go around, grab names and who's got a car and we can organise that and also make a mention of what you want to do out there if you want to spend the whole day in the forest or potentially come back. We have filmmakers, painters, photographers, multimedia artists, singers, actors, people who are here to experience and to capture what is here that is wild and scenic beauty. King's Run, the property looked after so well by the late Jeff King, became a secondary northern hub, with up to a dozen artists camped there at any one time. Jeff's wife, Margot, graciously allowed the Tarkine in Motion artists free reign over the property. Rugged coastal scenery perfectly juxtaposed with a mosaic of marsupial lawns. The tea tree scrub surrounding these lawns are riddled with animal pathways linking one grazing lawn to the next, like thatched gateways marking entrances to a labyrinthine network. I made my way further inland to another marsupial lawn and found a place I wanted to paint. It was a subtle kind of landscape, gentle and humming, as opposed to the striking, powerful and thrashing coastline near my camp. There was something about it that I was really drawn to. I think it felt secretive. There were signs of life everywhere, wombat holes, well-worn tracks, tightly clipped grass and millions of wallaby scats and footprints. The living seemed to happen cautiously though, in bursts, in a flurry in the evening, in the depths of the forest, in the burrows, on the horizon, in the shadows, too quick for my eyes to see or for my ears to really wrap around. So I sat down for a while to absorb it all and to capture one small rocky hill in a painting. The Tarkine Coast is an immeasurable asset for photographers. No matter how often or how many visits, the opportunities are endless. Several ventured down to the dune system south of the Thornton River. Sadly, intimidating behaviour from four-wheel drivers soured this experience. You can see these guys behind me. They've been streaming in all day. They're Australians, probably from all over the place. Coming down with their partner, their friends. A bit of fishing, a bit of recreation. And that's fine. But should we also be mindful of the damage by coming up here and roaring over these places? Roaring over the middens? Is there a place for everybody here to understand what we need to value in the past and what we need to respect today? You experience your freedoms with a sense of connection, with a sense of respect. Photographer Hilary Younger came to the Tarkine knowing her best work is done alone. Despite the number of artists and holiday makers in the area, she managed to find that solitude. Her work is doused in authenticity and born from true connection to place. The fiery orb of the sun is sinking down in an almost cloudless sky on an evening of rare calm. So benevolent that it has lured me out on the rocks, further and lower, until I am perched here with the deep sea a step away. The bull kelp trails with the ebb and flow of the swell. The sun approaches the sea stack further out and rests briefly in a perfect cradle in the rock silhouette. As it sinks, the golden glow deepens and intensifies. The rock backlit, a path of deep gold light thrown across the water toward me. I work quickly. This is the moment of magic, when the light will paint these rocks and water and a visual journey can be created. Beauty unmasked and deeply felt its destination. Alone and quiet, I walk back through the moonlit landscape. The night sky opens up above me, embraces and includes me. I recall the words of Edward Abbey. I am 20 miles or more from the nearest fellow human. But instead of loneliness, I feel loveliness. Loveliness and a quiet exaltation. Of course, some have an affinity for other places too, and the Tarkine can provide most anything. Nicole Anderson and Dan Brune rendezvoused on the slopes of Mount Edith in the Norfolk Range. 
Here they photographed a landscape manicured over the ages by fire and ice. Further north and inland, Dan Haley, Dan Panic, and Scott Cashins floated down the upper reaches of the Arthur River, documenting its beauty, reveling in its wildness and having plenty of fun along its winding course. Although the Arthur looks placid in these scenes, after heavy rain it is a truly wild and dangerous river. The thousands of broken trees that festoon the coast near the river's mouth demonstrate those forces. Musician Julius Schwing pondered the struggle between river and ocean when he penned this, accompanied by Helen Thompson. It is of course the rivers of the Tarkine that are its lifeblood and the key to a healthy landscape. It's only when you look from above that the length and breadth of the Tarkine wilderness becomes apparent. It's a travesty mining leases cover large areas of this wild country. One can only imagine the damage caused to these river systems should any more mining commence here. Existing minds push that reality into sharp focus. This is Mount Lindsay, 
Roads have been built and core sampling undertaken. And this is where its waste dump will lie, potentially polluting river systems all around the mountain. Of course, mining is not the only resource extraction business threatening the Tarkine. Several dozen artists visited proposed logging coops in the Rapid River area. Coop RD109A in particular became a significant place for many artists. Its old growth myrtle and tree fern forest provided the most poignant of places to reflect upon why they were there and the importance of the work they are doing. Lucy Landon Lane performed her forest dance under a tree so unique it became a totem for all that visited it. Olivia Hickey took samples of the small things in the coop, mainly ferns and some lichen. She was drawn back a month later to bring her work full circle. Musicians jammed, writers mused, while photographers documented all the beautiful things because for this coop, its millennia of evolution has but weeks or months remaining. In a neighbouring coop, Aviva Reed built a shrine as a lament to its future and something for those who will arrive with their machines to pause for thought and reflect upon. The landscape of this inland area is so complex it's actually hard to fathom. In a matter of minutes, one can go from sitting on the bank of a wild river like the Arthur, Rapid or Harmon, to then find oneself at a stunning waterfall, such as here at Wes Beckett's. Nearby Lake Chisholm, a giant flooded sinkhole, provides a peaceful still space, surrounded by giant eucalypts. Lake Chisholm hints at another world. This karst landscape marks a transitional zone. What sits in the darkness below is a mystery. The caves are a very delicate environment, and only a few photographers experienced with working in such a fragile terrain were chosen to document this area. The resulting imagery is truly stunning. Not far from the cave systems is the picnic area of Julius River. This was yet another hub for artists to stay for a day or several days. The two characters that welcomed all visitors were Andre Nikolinsky and Oliver Bain. Both photographers, they took up the challenge of something they had never attempted before. Since we got here into this area of the Tarkine, we've been well, attempting to do some time lapse of fungi. Like, We've done lots of still shots as well, but um, yeah. one of our main goals is, get, is to get some gr growing fungi over a period of time. Uh, everything here in the Tarkine is in motion. It's moving uh, and growing and dying and decomposing. So the end result of, of capturing this kind of motion will be um, to um, expand on what the other artists in the area are doing to document the motion of the Tarkine. While Oliver slaved over his growing fungi, Andre found other life down on the forest floor. We've got landscape artists making photos of landscape. We've got people doing time maps of weather rolling through the hills. And I think it, it's easy to overlook you know, the, the, the small things when, uh, when you're looking at the big things. It's only when one examines a small area of a natural place such as this that one can truly appreciate the incredible biodiversity of the forest as a whole. Close to Julius River are the Milkshake Hills, where Nick Monk, Olivia Hickey and Dan Brune spent time on the buttongrass-clad slopes and also in the Blackwood-dominated rainforest, a stunning place to explore. Nick also ventured into the Dempster Plains, an area like many others in the Tarkine, bearing all the signs of a cold fire burning regime dating back centuries. So much more than simply a beautiful natural environment, the whole of the Tarkine is a cultural landscape, curated through the eons by a people with intimate knowledge of its workings. 
were really passionate about not only do we reclaim our rights as human beings, but we reclaim our knowledge as a, not myth, but as a science within itself. And that has always inspired me to understand why is it that indigenous knowledges are looked on as mythology and Western knowledge is looked on as factual evidence and truth. Where really they're both trying to understand the mystery that is the universe, which is unknowable. Is this what we call Tarkain? This history eons old? No wood-filled books of war and greed, but simply lived from day to day, and writ so light upon the land, most eyes need guides to see. The graven rock, the midden shells, the circles left by hut and hide. A history made at nature's pace, slowly learning, slowly growing. Slow sculpture shaping both the world and those who shape it changing with the landscape being formed, finding place within the wild, being part of, not a part. As the weekend progressed, artists from the north headed south and those from the south came north and inland. The cross-pollination of creativity, goodwill and a spirit of collaboration growing with each serendipitous meeting. The Tarkine was well and truly in motion. The Tarkine, raging winds, they blow me down Crashing waves, oh, wild sound Ragged thread of needle rocks That seaweed strokes with olive locks Constantly in change, Tarkine in motion Set rolling, crystal wind swept, the murmurous roar of the shredding ocean, languages to be respoken, constantly in change, talking in motion. Lush rainforest to the wild frothing sea Don't rip it open, keep its integrity Protected permanently Wild and free Tells a thousand words Visions in nouns and verbs A shutter click, the paint's so slick The pen is swift, the ink still wet It's an opening to reconnect With Tarkine in motion Redefine, surprise yourself Keep an open mind Document, interpret the scene Unravel the spaces in between Draw and paint and print and sing This Tarkine in motion Ancient beauty facing shock in modern greed When it's loved and it's mine, then it's gone, don't you see? The talk I needs our help to be wild and free It's so wild It's so wild
Over the Easter period, there was also a full lunar eclipse, witnessed by dozens of artists in various locations. Some of the clearest skies were found above King's Run. The King's Run property became a haven at Easter and the source of many wonderful photographs, but also many painted works. I still feel more immersed in the place if I'm actually doing the painting. And it doesn't matter if the painting doesn't look like what it's meant to look like. It, it's a sense of the feeling. So if I, when I'm here, it, it's those rocks that grab me first. But another day, if the waves are crashing in, it might be the, the energy of the waves that I want to capture. And um, I use the camera if I want to record the shapes accurately, but the, the paper is to record you know, that, that, that feeling of what it's like there. As the weekend drew to a close, it became clear the artists had only just begun their process of connecting to place. So for many, it was time to plan return visits or get to work in their studios. Among them, painter Sam Wilkinson. I didn't really know what to expect uh, when we went to the Tarkine and I was a bit nervous of how I was going to, to uh, draw and even paint when I got back. Um, but I think I gained a bit of confidence on that trip when I came back. I only did tiny little sketches in my sketchbook. I knew how I was going to apply the paint and I think that's the biggest key with painting for me anyway. I don't think it was actually just, you know, a tree or a fern or anything like that, I really took away colours that I saw in the Tarkine. Sam was travelling with his brother Ben and another photographer Matt Green. Ben recalls how special it was to spend time with his brother in this way. When I remember the last morning we were there paddling up the Pyman River uh, with the mist on the water, beautiful sunrise, we were the only, only people out on the river there and the water was just like glass. and. Um, it was hard to hard to sort of say the impact that it has on you. I looked across at Sam as we were paddling up the river there and you know, we couldn't even say anything to each other. It was it was just amazing. You're just sort of humbled and a little bit belittled because of the size of the air and it's so powerful, but at the same time you just know that it's that it's threatened and it's so easily damaged and so fragile. So for me as a person it was you know, it was really quite emotional. But as a photographer it was just the, well, what do you capture? Yeah, there's so much there. Another painter, Carmen Hane, has almost completed a set of works for the first multimodal exhibition to emerge from the Tarkine Motion project. Initially I was wanting to paint large works, but it just seemed to be when I looked at all my photographs that I, can't, I just felt like they needed to be small. Um, I wanted them to be able to be small and detailed enough that they would draw people into the landscape to look really closely at it rather than being large and powerful I don't know I mean the landscape was kind of large and powerful but I just wanted to capture a bit of a more delicate side the jewelry making process was also impossible to complete in the field Olivia explains some of her processes and why she needed to return several times to complete her works the making process I've been through is the collection from kind of from the land and kind of trying to very carefully take that back into the studio. Um, it's then gone through either one of two processes. Casting has been the main process I've been used in developing my work. There's been two ways I've been doing that. One is a direct cast, so taking um, especially lichen from the Tarkine and just putting that straight through sort of a casting process to end up with a piece of metal lichen. The other process is making a silicon mould and let it half set and then kind of lay the ferns on top of the silicon mould which creates a sort of surface tension and picks up the imprints. Kelly Alexander returned to King's Run to film the movement piece she had been working on. It is a highly personal work created at a time of grief and in a place that allowed all emotion to be laid bare. The Tarkine Emotion project does not end here. Indeed, this is just the beginning, the first dramatic lurch forward towards a positive future for this unique area. Creatively, the potential of the Tarkine will never be fulfilled. 
It will continue to provide inspiration and draw artists from all fields for all time, just like it always has. The body of work emerging and the ever-growing network of artists finding a fresh approach to their processes is testament to the power of the Tarkine landscape and its potential if left untouched. The Tarkine is under threat, it is not protected and so it's up to the community now to recognise that this area needs to become a national park and it needs to have its world heritage values recognised. So at the Bob Brown Foundation we're working together over this project with artists to capture the Tarkine and take it to the world. As a collective, the Tarkine in Motion artists all wish to see a national park declared over large parts of this landscape. A dream the Bob Brown Foundation will be working hard to see realised. For the people who live on the outskirts of the Tarkine, this would be the best way to ensure a sustainable future for themselves, their families and the area they love. At the moment we have a government that has no interest in promoting its, its natural beauty or its cultural significance because it has other interests in the area. So the aim of the project is to shame, if you like, the government into uh, recognising this. So we're simply going to allow the public at large to see that there are a number of sustainable options and we can do that by creating a Tarkai National Park and a tourist hub. Well yes, I think uh, a lot of expert bodies have called for protection of the Tarkai. It is Aboriginal land and I think it should be returned to the traditional owners to manage. They're the ones who've got the expertise, the traditional knowledge and the right to manage it. What are the things that make me healthy and happy? And it's being out on country with particularly the old girls who laugh all the time and have had such full and at times tragic lives and yet still have such a awe-inspiring sense of yes to life and that for me is like oh, you know I, I want more of that. Um. Seventh generation from Manaligina, grandfather. Um, I've walked, uh, it's the first time I've walked this land here today, today and yesterday, and it was absolutely beautiful uh, rebirthing the, um, the hides that the women uh, done all so many years ago to catch the seals. It's holding stories, it's holding culture, um, it's making me feel that I was in the presence of those women that were here before me that walked this land. It's protecting our history for our children to come and see and um, experience what we've experienced as well. When we walked up there yesterday, it was so, so much wind around, but when we got into the uh, hut depression, there was no wind. We could have lit a fire and it was so beautiful and peaceful and you felt the presence of our women sitting there. Yep. Lord, you eat us the country of our ancestors. You travelled a long way, a long time. Dancing men near fires, dancing men near fires. Songs are within the land, singing. is flowing, flowing to the sea. Strength of our grandmothers, growing family strong, growing family strong. Takamono rala tikai 
the struggles of the past and the present, the Tarkine remains a landscape of incredible grace. The way its ragged rocks give way to soft grasses, ghostly forests whisper back at the roaring forties, animals bounce from open plain to lush rainforest, rivers rush or they meander, stones rumble under the surge of the sea or they simply sit, wait and watch. This state of grace is what gives rise to a sense of wonder, and with that freedom is born the purest joy. And that's how you get the cameraman! Just playing. That's what it's all about, having fun. I'm just a simple person Living on the earth Came here to this island Through the luck of my birth I've no special title, I don't hold a degree So what do I know about politics, environment or the economy? I'm just a simple person with the same needs as you Clean air, fresh water, give me shelter too Food on the table, time with my family A fair day's work for a fair day's pay A place in a community, I need a place I need a place Food on the table, and time for my family I'm just a simple person And I don't understand How we build our children's future Just by pillaging the land I may be a simple person But I simply can't believe That the answer to all of our problems Lies in digging holes and chopping down trees there are those who argue we must continue down this road It's what our forefathers have done It's everything we know But to them I ask this question How much longer can it last? Are we working for a future? Or simply living in the past? Are we living in the past? 
living in the past are we working for a future or living in the past I'm just a simple person looking for a way of being in this century I try to do my best each day I don't claim to have the answer but I ask we stop and think what price we pay for what we do today for every short-term fix sometimes I get the feeling we're being taken for a ride by those who hold the strings fueling anger on both sides they talk about tomorrow in terms of industry and growth but history shows when they've taken what they came for they'll just pack up and go they'll pack up and go yeah history shows once they've taken what they came for they'll just pack up and go